Thank you for being so numerous out this evening uh, to reflect on the theme of Parish Alive. This, there are four seasons. Each season we've chosen a, a special theme. And this theme, this season is going to be the word, the word of God, a word of life. And what we want to do during the six weeks of Parish Alive is try to reflect on what the word of God means for us. So what are we going to do this evening? I'm going to do a, an overview of the notion of God's word in, in Catholic tradition and of the six sub-themes, because we have a sub-theme every week for the six weeks. And uh, after the little stretching break, um, maybe 20 minutes or 25 minutes of, uh, you know, for any questions or for any uh, time of exchange. So 1962 to 65, the Second Vatican Council, one of the things that happened was a rediscovery of the importance of the Word of God. The bishops of the world were gathered for um, the fall four times, huh? 62, the fall of 62 and of 63, 64, 65. So during those four years, as they talked about things, they published 16 texts. And one of the most important texts was a text called Dei Verbum, which translates as the Word of God. This text on the Word of God spoke about how important Scripture is for us. But the point that I want to make here is that most people, most Catholics, when I say the Word of God, they'll think right away of the Bible. And they're not completely wrong, but they're not completely right either. Because for us, the Word of God is more than the text. As a matter of fact, the text is, in a sense, secondary. It's essential, but it's secondary. And that's what I want to try to explain to you. And to help us understand the difference, I want to speak for a moment about the sacred book of the Muslims, which is called the Koran. Now, how was the Koran written? What happened was uh, the, the founder of Islam, Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad was, um, he was a, a merchant. He, he traveled, uh, did a commerce a lot, you know. The, the, country where, the countryside where he lived was basically polytheistic. There were many gods that were worshipped. We're talking about, by the way, around this stuff, but around the year 600, okay? So about the 6th century after Christ. So there were no Christians there. There, there, were, there were groups of Jewish people. There were some Jewish colonies around where he lived, some Jewish tribes. But most of the tribes were polytheistic. They had many gods. And... Uh, as a matter of fact, Mecca, which has the, the, the great pilgrimage site, was a site that was dedicated to many, many gods and goddesses. So there were idols, many idols. Muhammad, as he traveled, met up with Jews, met up with Christians, was exposed to different ways of thinking about God, and started going into, you know, the mountains to, to pray. A bit like Jesus, you know, in the gospel it says Jesus went into the mountains to pray. Well, Muhammad did that. He'd go up into the countryside, into the hills around Mecca, and he'd go pray. And he started having some very profound mystical experiences while he was praying. And in these mystical experiences, he felt that God was talking to him through the angel Gabriel. And that the angel was telling him, write this, write this, write this. Now, he didn't know how to write. So what he would do is the, 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 the words were so vivid for him that when he would come down from these experiences, he would tell the stories of what was said to be written and others would write it down. And that's how the Koran was developed. The Koran is basically the writing down of his experiences. And so it's literally God speaking to the people through Muhammad. That's, that's what the, the Muslims believe, that God is speaking through Muhammad to the people. So it is first person singular. It's I, I'm telling you this and I'm telling you that and you will do this and you will do that. So it's always God speaking. And the Quran then, for the Muslims, really is the word of God. Because it is God that spoke. Now, which language did God speak? Arabic. So that was God's language. And for the Muslims, translating the Quran, I mean, you have to do it so that people who don't speak Arabic can understand. But for them, once you've translated, it's no longer the Quran. It's no longer the word of God. It's a translation of the Word of God. But for them, the Word of God really is this Arabic text because God dictated this to Muhammad. That's the way they understand it. We Christians do not consider the Bible in the same way. First of all, the Bible was not written by one person. It was written by many, many people. It was not written during one lifetime. It was written over many lifetimes. 
There are texts in the Bible that, that we can date approximately 900 years before the time of Christ. And there are texts that were written within the 100 years after Christ. So the Bible was written over a period of 1,000 years. And what's more is that there are a whole series of books. The word Bible comes from the Greek ta biblia, which means the books. It's not the book, it's the books, because there are a whole bunch of books in this. This is kind of a library. Uh, in, in olden days, you would have had scrolls, you know, one for each of the books. But here we've, we managed to compile it and put it in one big book, so that it's a number of books. And the books, they're all, there are all sorts of things in that book. There are prayers, like the book of Psalms. There are histories, like the book of Judges. There are wisdom texts, you know, people writing down the wisdom of the time. For example, the book of Proverbs or the book of Wisdom. There are texts that, that are reflections on the beginning of the world and on the end of the world. There are texts which tell the stories of great heroes. There are texts which tell, obviously, the stories of Jesus. There are texts which are prophets, the, the writings of prophets. There, there's a play. There's a play in the, in the Bible called the Song of Songs. It's a play between uh, a man and a woman looking for each other. You know, so there's all sorts of things in, in the Bible. Did God dictate the, the Bible? Did God kind of send an angel down to speak to the people who wrote these texts to whisper into their ears away? No. No. These, these are the writings of men and women, probably mostly men, unfortunately, but maybe some women. But the, the, the fact is that these, these are the writings of people, but very religious people, very spirit-filled people. So we say that the text is inspired in the sense that the person who's writing it is writing it under the guidance of the Spirit, but not under the control of the Spirit. So that the words that are used are not God's words, they're our words. So somebody said the Bible is God's word with human words. So it's our words to express the mystery of God. Our relationship to the book is very different from the relationship of the Muslims to the Quran. For the Muslims, the Quran is God's word in the sense that these words were written down by God, dictated by God to Muhammad, and he wrote down, or he had these words written down, so these are the texts. For us, the Bible is a library of inspired books through which God slowly is revealing his plan for us and his love for us. And in a sense, God's word, before being the text, is the experience of the people and, and their experience that's being reflected on. Because before they wrote the story of Moses, for example, the events happened, right? I mean, something happened there. Moses led the people out of the slavery in Egypt. So there was an event. Before there's a, before there's a text, there's an event. And the event is recognized by the people as being God doing something in history, God doing something in our lives, God changing something. And so they start reflecting on this event. And ultimately then somebody writes down, what's the person doing? The person's writing down the story. Including in the story is the reflection, the interpretation of the event. All of this is God's word. And then we take it. And we meditate on it and we see how it changes our lives. So do you see all the steps that are taken? An event is reflected upon, is written down, is read, and has an impact in the person's life. So from the event to the person's life, all of that is God's word for us. All of that is God's word. The event, the reflection, the writing, the reading, and the effect. So from there to there. And obviously, as I said, the text is essential because if you didn't have the text, we couldn't do anything. Because the text gives us the story as it's been reflected on, and it's the text that allows us to read, and so that story can have an impact on us. So the text is essential. But the, the Word of God is all of that for us. When we speak God's Word, it's all of that for us. And of course, all of this leads to the person of Jesus. Because in Jesus we believe that God entered into human history. God became man. And in becoming man then, 
When Jesus, whatever the, Jesus did reveals to us who God is, whatever Jesus said reveals us to us who God is, and the great revelation of God's love for us is Jesus' death on the cross. So if we look for the ultimate word of God, if you were to say, what is God's ultimate word? There it is. It's Jesus dying on the cross for us. That's God's greatest word to us. It's not a text. It's a life being poured out. That is God's greatest word for us. But we wouldn't know about it if we didn't have the texts. <laughs> Get the point I'm trying to make here? So God's word, when we speak about it in the Catholic Church, it's a very, it, it, it's, it's a very uh, broad expression that means a lot of things. It ultimately means Jesus himself. Jesus is God's word. Let me just go to the beginning of John's gospel. It's the only passage that I know in Greek from memory. I had to memorize that for my exam. And what does it mean? It means in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so who who is John speaking about here? He's speaking about in God there is a trinity of persons. The Father, and here he calls the second person the Word and the Spirit. So the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. The Word became flesh, became Jesus. But that Word has existed from the beginning of time, from before time. And that is God's Word to start with. God's Word is the second person of the Trinity. That Word of God enters into human history to speak to us and to tell us about God's love for us. You know, So that's my first point. I, I want to make that point clear that when we speak about God's Word, we're speaking of a very broad sense of what God's Word is. It's not just the text of Scripture. That's why, you know, the Muslims have an expression. An expression. The Muslims speak the peoples of the book. And when they say that, the peoples of the book, they're talking about the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims because they say the Jews have the Torah, the Christians have the Gospels, and we have the Koran. But our relationship to the text is not the same. So we're, we're not, in a sense, Christians are not people of a book. The book is important, but we're not, first of all, people of a book. We are people of a person. <laughs> That's why our, our, our name is Christian. For Christ, we belong to Christ. Christ is God's word. So when, when we speak about God's word, let's remember that first of all, it is a person, Jesus. Ultimately, it is a person who enters into history and speaks to us. Okay, first point. Second point I wanted to do was I wanted to speak a bit about how the word of God or scripture became important in the history of the Jewish people. Because that's really important for us to understand why it's important for us. We, we, we've inherited our relationship to the text from, from the Jewish people. So it's important for us to understand well, how did this happen for the Jews? Uh, because, as I say, this text was written over a period of a thousand years, these texts, these books, right? So, you know, when Moses was going around, he didn't have a Bible. You know, we sometimes forget that. There was no Bible in Moses' time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little thing that I've been doing a few times in the past few weeks there. This is, this is going to be the time of Jesus here, the year zero, okay? That way is, that way is us. 2,000 years away, that's us. Here's Jesus' time. And I'm going to walk backwards in time. Each step I take is going to be 100 years, okay? So 100 years before Jesus. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1,000 years before Jesus. One millennium before Jesus. I'll keep going back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I don't want to get too close before, not to get feedback. Eight. So, 1,800 years before the time of Christ. Who lived 1,800 years before the time of Christ? Anybody? Abraham, thank you very much. Abraham lived 1,800 years before the time of Christ. That's a long time ago, right? Because from Christ to us, there's 2,000 years to go there. So this long, long time, Abraham. What was Abraham about? Abraham was the first one. Abraham lived like, like uh, Muhammad. He lived in a country where many gods were worshipped. And each tribe had their kind of own special god. And Abraham somehow came to know a god whose name was revealed to him as Yahweh. 
You know, so, okay, Yahweh, God, Yahweh, this is my God. And this God, Yahweh, makes a, a, a commitment to Abraham. He says, Abraham, if you commit yourself to take me as your God, I will take care of you. You know, we'll make, we'll make a pact here. If you're my best friend, I'll be your best friend. You know what I'm saying? Don't go to the other gods, though. Everybody else has their gods. Don't go to the others. I'm going to be your God, okay? So Abraham says, all right, I'll take you. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Abraham's son, Isaac, and his grandson, Jacob. And, you know, it becomes a family God. Yahweh becomes a family God. And this goes on for 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12. For about 600 years, there's this tribe that has a God called Yahweh. Now, this tribe goes through a really rough time, emigration, and uh, they find themselves in, this, in Egypt, and ultimately they lose wars, they find themselves in slavery. And, and one, one of the members of this tribe is raised among the Egyptians, and, well, he goes through a mystical experience again. You know, mystical experiences, powerful experiences of God. Goes through an experience and he sees a burning bush, that, but the bush isn't burning. And so he, he goes to this bush and, and the voice comes from the bush saying, take off your sandals, this is holy ground. And he says, I am, you know, I've heard the call of my people crying to me and I'm going to send you to save them. And Moses says, well, who are you? He says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I'm your people's God. I am Yahweh. I'm the God who is, you know. Yahweh means uh, he who is, is. Basically, it means that. It's, it's a very, very strange word. The, by the way, the Jews do not pronounce God's name, huh? You know, I'm, I'm saying Yahweh, but the Jews do not pronounce God's name. Because, you know, the second commandment that says, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain? Well, the Jews, in order not to take the, God, the Lord's name in vain, they just don't take it. If you don't use God's name ever, then you're safe, you won't use it in vain. So what they use is, they, they use uh, Eloha, which means the God, or Adonai, which means Lord. All right? They don't use Yahweh. So anyway, um, so it, Moses experiences Yahweh the God speaking to him and leads the people out of slavery and they reestablish a new covenant. And here the covenant is, is framed in what we call the Ten Commandments. God says, Yahweh says, if you follow these commandments, then you will be my people, I will be your God. Okay? New covenant. Covenant with Abraham, covenant with Moses. Fine. So we go 200 years. We're in the year 1000 now. So this is one millennium before the Jesus, before Jesus. Who's, who shows up a millennium before Jesus? King David. By this time, the Israelites are in, uh, in Israel. They're in the promised land. And they've chosen themselves a king. Actually, God chose the king for them. The prophet anointed him. Great, the great King David. Now, during David's time, this is when texts start being written. Because now that you have a kingdom, you know, and you have a government, and you have bureaucrats, well, they've got to find something to do, right? So, you know, civil servants, right? They've got to find make-work projects here, you know? So let's write our history. Actually, the, the, the histories were always told. The histories were always told. They might have been written down to. But what's happening here is they start being formalized. They're being structured. They start being organized, these texts. So that here are the texts that, for example, we know that David wrote some texts because David was a poet. Uh, David wrote uh, hymns that we call the Psalms. He didn't write all 150 of them, but he certainly wrote some of them. And, and so some of the songs that he wrote, you know, were collected. And the stories of Moses were collected. The stories of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob were collected. All these stories were collected. About a hundred years later, somebody wrote down one of the old creation stories from way back when. And that's the, what's now the first chapter in the Bible. But it was only written a hundred years later. Then the funny thing is that 300 years after that, somebody wrote another creation story, which is the second chapter in the Bible. You know, but the Spirit hovered over the way. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. You know, and God said, it was, that's the first chapter. This 
Actually, that first chapter was written here. I'm getting it mixed up. That first chapter was written 600 years before Christ. That's the first, the first chapter. You know, God said, let there be light. And then God said, let there be, uh, you know, stars and moons. and You know, that was over here is the story of, in the beginning, God made a garden. And in the garden, he had all sorts of trees and plants and everything was beautiful. And there was a tree called the tree of life and the tree of, you know, and then uh, he decided to make uh, a human being. So he took the earth and he molded and he breathed into man. And, he, and, and this, this earthy person, Adam, became, you know, a human being. And then he said, hmm, you need some help here. I'll make you a woman to help you. And so he made, you know, and here, so God doesn't, how does God create here in this story? By his word? No, not even by his breath, with his hands. He's molding, he's molding like a sculptor. He's molding, taking the earth, and then, and then he breathes into him. Old story, 900 years before Jesus. 600 years before Jesus, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God said, let there... So those are two very, very different stories. But in our Bible, they're mashed together. Boom, boom. But they were written 300 years apart. Anyway, I'm coming back to David. So David, all these stories start being compiled. They start... You know, and, and the people from the north of Israel had some traditions. The people from the south of Israel had other traditions. They started taking all these texts together and putting them together. Now, how do we call the people, the descendants of Abraham here? How do we call them? You know? Israelites. When they were here under Moses, what were they called? In Israel, in Egypt, what were they called? The Hebrews. The Hebrews. That was the word that was used. The Hebrews. But then over here, the Hebrews was actually the name the Egyptians gave them. But they weren't Israelites because they weren't living in Israel yet. It was when they got into the promised land, set themselves down, settled, called call their country Israelite, that Israel, that they became Israelites, right? Now, let's move forward. Nine, eight, seven, six hundred years. Catastrophe! Catastrophe! This, this, in 600 years before Christ is one of the most important events in the history of salvation, and we don't know it. It's called the exile. Okay, the exile. Let me go back. 1,000 years. David. Moses. When Moses pulled the people out of Egypt and into, into Israel, what, what's that called, you know? Exodus. Exodus. It means going out. They're going out of Egypt into Israel. But here, in the year 600, around the year 600 before Christ, tragedy, catastrophe, the exile. What happens? What happens is that neighboring countries become very powerful. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, they start conquering the local countries around and eventually they set their eyes on Israel, which is just a minor country in the Middle East at that time. Still is a minor country in the Middle East. You know, and, and they came down and they conquered and as they conquered, they did horrible things. Well, horrible th war is a horrible thing, you know. So they, one of the things that they did uh, to, the, uh, to Jerusalem is that they, they, they destroyed Jerusalem. They, they set fire to the temple. The temple, by the way, had been built by David's son, Solomon, back here. So 400 years of the temple, the temple was destroyed. It was burned. It was, it was ransacked. The, the, the tables of the Ten Commandments, which were in the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was in the temple. They were stolen. We, we, we don't know what happened to them afterwards. So everything was lost. The, the temple was destroyed. The walls of the city were destroyed. Everything was destroyed. And all the leaders of the country, all the, the king, the descendant of David, the king and... Uh, and, and the, the uh, administrators of the country and the high priest, everything, they were all taken and sent into exile. They were forced to leave Israel and they had to go live, well, in what is now Iraq. They had to go live now where Baghdad is now. They lost everything. They lost their king. They lost their land. They lost their temple. Everything that God had promised them, they lost. Now, Let's go back here a moment. Here I am with Moses. It's a covenant. You know, with, when God makes the covenant with Moses, Moses has a ritual to kind of 
make the covenant to seal the covenant. What does he do? He takes a bull, he slashes a bull's throat, takes the blood of the bull, pours about half of it on the altar, which represents God, and takes the other half and just kind of sprinkles it on the people as a sign that the blood that's on the altar is also on the people and that binds us to God, you see? Kind of a messy ritual. Aren't you glad we don't do that anymore? <laughs> you know, when you have the priest going down, sprinkling you with water, just be glad. <laughs> Smile. All right? So, so this, was the, what, this was the ritual that, that Moses had. And when they, when they established the temple... What was the ritual of the temple? The ritual of the temple was sacrifice, blood sacrifices. They would bring animals, they would kill the animals, put the blood over the altar, and the people would leave with the animal to eat it at home. This was the ritual, this was the way they prayed to Yahweh. It was with sacrifices. But here, and, and the priests, obviously the priest's job was to sacrifice the animals, so all the priests work at the temple. It was the only place you could do this, was at the temple. You couldn't do it anywhere else. If you, if you lived somewhere else, it was like, if the, it's as if, if the temple was in Cornwall and you lived in Ottawa, too bad. You come to Cornwall if you want to pray to Yahweh. Because this is the only way we can offer sacrifices in the temple. So everybody had to pilgrimages to the temple all the time. Actually, uh, there, there were three pilgrimages a year to, to Jerusalem. But imagine, I mean, the people who lived, you know, they had to walk. So they would walk days, days, days to get to Jerusalem to be able to offer the sacrifice and go back. Anyway, so here we are. The, the temple is, 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 uh, is centered on sacrifices. Now, the year 600, the temple is destroyed. Where can the priests offer sacrifice? Nowhere. Nowhere. The priesthood falls apart. There's no reason for a priesthood because he can't offer sacrifices. He can't offer sacrifices because there's no temple. They're in Babylon. There's, the, there's no temple in Babylon. How can they pray to Yahweh? You know, in Babylon. And you know that great psalm. By the, the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we wept. We're remembering, you know, the, 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 the songs of Zion. You know, they said, why don't you say, our captors said, why don't you sing us a song? How could we sing a song of Yahweh in a strange land? You see, here they, they're, they're in Babylon. They're no longer in home. They've been taken away from their homes. How can we sing a song of Yahweh in a strange land? And then if I forget you, Jerusalem, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, you know? Like, God forbid that I should ever forget Jerusalem. That, that psalm was written right in Babylon. That's why we know it wasn't King David who wrote that. David was 400 years before that. This was written at this time. It's, it's an incredibly powerful psalm expressing the longing of the people and their loss. Their loss. So what do you do when things aren't going well? What do you do when, when th there's great loss, when, when there's tragedy that strikes? Um, you know, I, th I think of, you know, deaths. When people die, you know, somebody you love died, and, and you get together with it. What do you do? You tell stories. You tell stories. You start telling the stories of, remember when? Remember this? Remember that? And you start telling stories. You pull out old photo books, right? You, you, take, you take out the books of photos, and you look at them. You say, remember this? Remember that? And all of a sudden, and this is what happened here. In the year 600, this is what happened. They started pulling out all those old stories and the, 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 the scrolls that they had and everything. And they started gathering them. And they started reading them to each other so that they would gather. They couldn't gather at the temple anymore to offer sacrifice. What would they do? They'd gather to read the stories. And this is where the Bible started taking shape. This is the moment where the, the texts started coming together. And this is where these stories started becoming for the people the way to get in touch with God. No longer through sacrifice at the temple, by, but by telling the stories, by listening to the stories together, by reflecting on these stories. That's how it started becoming for them the Word of God. And from this moment on, we won't talk anymore about, we will still talk about the Israelites, but we will start speaking about the Jews. Judaism was born at this time. Judaism was not born at the time of Moses. Judaism was born at this time because Judaism is centered on the Torah. 
particularly the five first books of Scripture called the Torah, which means the law. Those are the first five books. That's when these books were, were kind of bound together into a kind of a whole. And from that moment on, you didn't touch them anymore. This, this now became God's word to us. And, and from this moment on, when the Jews would gather, if they were not at the temple, what would they do? They'd gather, they'd listen to the words, and, and they would pray over the meaning of those words. And that became the center of their cult. The exile lasted seven years, long enough for the, the older people to die, long enough for a second generation to be born that didn't remember Jerusalem at all. Yes, that's where the synagogue started. Exactly. This is where the synagogue... Because synagogue basically means gathering. That's all it means. A gathering. And so, but, but by the time the exile was over, by the time a new king decided to allow them to go back to Jerusalem, some of the Jews at this point, I mean, the, the second generation, third generation, they didn't remember Jerusalem. They had good jobs here in Babylon. They were doing okay. And, you know, the idea of going to a temple, they had never known the temple. They had never known sacrifices. For them... This was what it meant to be Jewish. You know, honor the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath, be circumcised, and, uh, and, and read the Torah, read the law. And, and so a lot of the Jews did not go back to Jerusalem. So that the major community of Jews was in, uh, in Jerusalem, but the second great community of Jews in the world was in Babylon for many centuries because these people stayed in Babylon. Others had fled to Egypt. Some had fled to Egypt. There was a great city called Alexandria. Not Alexandria, Ontario. Alexandria in Egypt. <laughs> and by the way, the bishop of Alexandria is a patriarch in Egypt. He's, he's called a patriarch. And he's called your beatitude. So when I meet the nuncio, our papal nuncio, he's always saying, Oh, il patriarca di Alexandria! Sua you know. And then when I shaved my beard, he says, oh, you shouldn't have shaved your beard. The patriarch always has a beard, you know. <laughs> anyway, little joke. So, so here we are. I want to tell you, so, so 70 years later, but some of them went back and they started rebuilding. They started by rebuilding the walls and everything. They eventually rebuilt the temple. But I want to read you this text. And I'm standing here because this is the year they came back. I want to read you this text. Um, from the book of Nehemiah, which tells the story. If you ever want to read it, Estras and Nehemiah tells all the story of what happened at this time. Chapter 7, the repopulation of Jerusalem. When the wall had been rebuilt and I had hung the doors, the gatekeepers were appointed. I entrusted the administration of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani and to Hananiah, the commanders of the citadel, for he was more trustworthy, God-fearing man than many others. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem must not be opened until the sun gets hot. And the doors must be shut and barred before it goes down. See what they're doing is they're protecting the city here. So that's the first thing they do. They build the, the walls. The city was large and spacious, but the population was small and the houses had not been rebuilt. My God then inspired me to assemble the nobles, the officials and the people for the purpose of taking a census by families. I discovered the register of those who had returned in the first group. And these I entered here. And then there's the list of the families that came back. And it goes on, you know, the number and men of the people. Sons of Parash, 2,172. Sons of Sephathiah, 372. Sons of Era, 652. It's a, it's a census that he's taking of the people who've come back. And then he says, now on the seventh month, when the people, when the seventh month came around, all the people gathered as one man in the square in front of the water gate. Now the houses aren't rebuilt, right? People are living in tents. In, in Jerusalem. The temple is not rebuilt. The walls have been rebuilt. The people feel safe enough to gather. And I asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses. The book of the law of Moses is actually five books, the first five books, what, what the Jews call the Torah. The Torah. So the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay? So the first five books. And um, so I asked Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which Yahweh had prescribed for Israel. Accordingly, on the first day of the seventh month, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, consisting of men and women and all those old enough to understand. And in the square in front of the water gate, in the presence of the men and women and of those old enough to understand, he read from the book from dawn till noon. 
All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. This, my friends, is a liturgy of the word. It's the first recorded liturgy of the word in the Bible. It's the first time we see the people gathering to listen to the word of God. The scribe Ezra stood on a wooden dais erected for the purpose, like this. And beside him stood on his right, well, then they've got all these strange names that we can't pronounce. In, in full view of all the people, he opened the book, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. That's, that's just like us at Mass. When we read the Gospel, everybody stands. All the people stood up, and then Ezra blessed Yahweh the great God, and all the people raised their hands and answered, Amen, Amen, and they bowed down, they bowed down face to the ground, prostrated themselves before Yahweh. And the Levites explained the law to the people while the people kept their places. Ezra read from the book of the law, translating and giving sense. Why does he have to translate? Because they lost their language in Babylon. What, what language is the Old Testament written in? In Hebrew. That was the language that they spoke in Israel up until this moment. But at this moment, they were brought out to Babylon. In Babylon, they spoke Aramaic. And so they lost their Hebrew so that the children and the grandchildren no longer spoke Hebrew. So Ezra was reading in Hebrew, then he'd have to translate into Aramaic. What language did Jesus speak? Aramaic. Aramaic became the language, the common language of the people. The book was still written in Hebrew. You know, so Hebrew was the language. That's why you had to have, you know, scholars, the, the, the scribes. You know the scribes in the New Testament? Who are they? They're people who go study Hebrew so that they can read the text and then they can translate. So they, they would translate. So Ezra would read, they would translate, and then the Levites would explain. That's a homily. That's what it is. And then His Excellency Nehemiah and the prescribed Ezra and the Levites who were instructing the people said to the people, Today is sacred to Yahweh your God. Do not be mournful. Do not weep. For all the people were in tears as they listened to the words of the law. So you see, this is, and, and the title of this, in this is the Jerusalem Bible, the title they give to this passage is Judaism is born. This is the moment when the book that we call the Bible, at least part of the Bible, became the way that we kind of entered into relationship with God by listening to this text. So that by the time Jesus arrives, 600 years later, right? Jesus does not live in Jerusalem. He doesn't hang around Jerusalem. There's, he doesn't go. He goes to the temple a couple of times. According to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he only goes once, actually. Uh, well, Luke says he went when he was a kid, too. But, um, oh yeah, and he says when he was born. Um, John says he went three times to Jerusalem during his public ministry. But, but his, his ministry is not around the temple. It's in the countryside. In the countryside there is no temple. What, what are there? There are gathering places, synagogues, where people gather. And we know this great passage from Luke, uh, Luke's Gospel, when after his baptism, Jesus goes back to Capernaum, his hometown where he's living at this point, Nazareth, sorry. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day as he usually did. This was his habit. This was Jesus' habit, to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read. See, it's a liturgy of the Word. It's the Word of God here. They handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. So they have the scrolls of Scripture. One of the scrolls is Isaiah. They give him the scroll of Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it's written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to bring the good news to the afflicted, sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim a year of favor from the Lord. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the assistant, and he sat down. And all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, this text that we've just heard from God's Word, this text is being fulfilled today even as you are listening. That's a liturgy of the word. Reading from the text and a homily from it. Jesus' homily was the shortest recorded homily in the history of the church, you know? One line. Don't we wish we all had priests like that, right? Because Jesus knew that he'd get it right when he said it. Priests have to talk longer and bishops even longer in the hopes that something intelligent will come out at one point, you know? But, but, but what I'm trying to get across to you here is how... In the early church then, they had a very strong sense of the importance of God's Word, Scripture. St. Paul will write 
to, to Timothy. And he'll say, use God's Word. Use the Scriptures. Study them. They are good to remind people of the true doctrine. See? Now, when Paul started, this is Jesus. Jesus never wrote anything. Then, we don't, it's not a whole hundred years here. Jesus died and rose in the year 33. And Paul, by the year 45, about 12 years later, starts writing. Now, when Paul was writing, he had no idea that he was writing Scripture. He had no idea that he was writing the Bible. For him, the Bible was what we call the Old Testament, the Jewish Scriptures. That, for him, was it. He wasn't, he wasn't, you know, sitting down saying, okay, now i got to complete the Bible. He just started writing letters. He started writing letters. And at the same time, people started writing down bits and pieces of Jesus' stories. Bits, his miracles, his sayings, his, his passion and his death, the stories of his resurrection, the stories of his birth. And what happened slowly is that some of the leaders of these communities said, boy, some of us are getting old and we're dying. We better get these together, you know, and kind of make a sense of them. And that's how the Gospels were written. They were compiled. You know, they were bring the things together, put it into one story, into a cohesive form. And that became the gospel. So there was a, a gospel written in, in, in Palestine. That's Matthew's gospel. There was a gospel written probably in, in Ephesus in Turkey. That's uh, um, John's gospel. Uh, probably a gospel written in Rome. And that's Mark's gospel. And, and, and a gospel written in Greece. And that's Luke's gospel. You know, So these gospels were written in different parts of the world where the communities were gathered. And slowly, some, some people started exchanging those texts and saying, oh, there's, there's, there's a gospel that comes from Greece. Why don't we look at this one, you know? And people started collecting the gospels and the letters of Paul and of a few of the other apostles. And finally, they decided, this also is scripture for us. This also is God's word for us. Because how can we get a hold of Jesus? How can we know anything about Jesus if not through these texts? And so these texts became God's word for us too. And that's why in the church, when we celebrate the Mass, we always start with the Liturgy of the Word. We always start with readings from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. And there's always a homily and there's always prayers. And so that whole first part of the Mass is kind of, it comes from the Jewish synagogue. That's where it comes from. That's where it started. And, and, and so we, we, we are very close to the Jewish people in our understanding of Scripture and its importance in our lives. Do you remember the, the great song, if I was a rich man, all day long I'd be biddy bum. If I was a wealthy man, I wouldn't have to work hard, right? And and one of the verses he says, it's towards the end of the song, he says, and and if I was a wealthy man, then I could spend my afternoons, you know, meditating and studying the Torah. And that would be the greatest gift of all. See? That would be the greatest gift. The greatest gift for, for a, a Jew is to have enough money that he can take time to study Scripture. Uh, it's incredible. Do you know, the, the, for a bar mitzvah, you, you've heard of bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah. You know, it's, it's, it's the ceremony wherein a, a young person is considered an adult, right? They can count to make up the ten people that are needed to form a synagogue. So, so to become bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah for girls, but to become bar mitzvah, you have to get up and you have to read a text in Hebrew. So the kids who want to be bar mitzvah, they spend years studying Hebrew. It's as if we decided, okay, well, we'll confirm you in grade seven, but you've got to learn Latin first. How many of our kids would learn Latin? How many of us would learn Latin? You know? And then, and then they, they, they learn it and they read it. And not only do they have to proclaim it, they also have to give a teaching on it. They have to prepare a teaching on it, a homily, to become bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah. It, it's incredible. This is the attachment of the Jewish people to the Word of God. This is where our attachment to God's Word comes from also. Except the difference is that we believe that ultimately God spoke in a final way in His Son Jesus with the closing of the scriptures is the closing of public revelation. We believe that once God, once, once this is the Bible, there is no new revelation to be expected. No new revelation. God has said everything he's had to say. All we have to do now is figure it out. 
We have to apply it. This is God's word. So this is what we're going to be focusing on during the next month. Now we have six six sub themes, and I just want to go through the six sub themes very quickly. The first sub theme is that God's word is a word that challenges us, and and that's that's so important for us to realize. God's word challenges us. You know, when Jesus came and you know started preaching, his first words were, according to the Gospel of Matthew of Mark, he said. Um, the times are at hand. The kingdom of God is here. Change your hearts and believe in this good news. Change your hearts. Change the way you're acting. Change the way you are. This is, this is the first word that Jesus says. It's a challenging word. It wasn't, Jesus was not making a popular message here. He was telling the people, you have to change. And he was trying to change a lot of things. Trying to change the whole way that people are related to God. Ch- change the way they're related to each other. Change, try to change the the religious system, the political system that he was involved in and that his people was involved in, Jesus was really challenging the people. He challenged, oh my God, did he ever challenge the Pharisees who were considered the most religious men of all. And he would say, you are hypocrites because your acts are in a certain way, but your hearts are not. So Jesus challenged tremendously, tremendously. God's word is a word that challenges us. And that's that's where the expression... We stand under the judgment of Scripture. Meaning that our lives need to be ruled by God's Word, not the other way around. We don't pick up the Bible in order to find the passage that will kind of tell us, oh, that's good, just keep on doing whatever you've been doing. You know, it really has to be for us a word that challenges us, a word that says, get up, move, change something in your hearts. You know, so you have to ask yourself, what in my life has changed because I read Scripture? What do I do differently because I read Scripture? What do I do differently in my life because I've, I, I read a text and, and it challenged me? This is the... If, if we haven't realized that God's Word is challenging, we haven't really met God's Word yet. It's just a bunch of nice stories. Red, red, red Riding Hood is not a challenging story. You can read Red Riding Hood, have fun, put her away, and then continue what you're doing. If that's the way we read Scripture. We haven't understood anything about Scripture. We read nice stories about Jesus said this. Yeah, that's nice. Jesus said that. Oh, is that ever pretty? And Jesus said that. Oh, that's strange. You know, and, and then Jesus, Jesus died on the cross. And yeah, and then he rose again. Oh, yeah, all right. That's good. And, but what does it change? What does it change in your lives? That's the first question we have to ask ourselves. Okay? So that'll be the first week. <laughs> nice way to start, huh? But God's word not only changes, challenges us, it also enlightens. And that's the second week. It enlightens us. God's word kind of opens up the meaning of life for us. God's word tells us which way we should be going. When, when we're wondering what is right and what is wrong, we can go into, into scripture to find out. You know, it can be things that are moral in the sense, basic moral rules. God's, God's word clarifies things for us. You shouldn't steal. You shouldn't kill. I mean, those are basic rules. But, but if everybody did it, we'd be a lot better off. I mean, those basic rules. But it goes so much further than that. God's, God's word enlightens us, tells us how to live our lives, and gives meaning to our lives. So many people live their lives without any meaning. I, I, was, I was just reading one of the Psalms tonight, and it just struck me. The, 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 it's such a hard sentence. A wealthy man who is content is like cattle being led to the slaughter. That's that's a terrible sentence, huh? But but what he's saying, uh, yeah, it's not just a a wealthy man who is content. A wealthy man man who is content and is not thinking is like uh, a bull, an animal being led to the slaughter. Yeah, you're, you're content, you're fat. You know, the fattened calf is content until they slit its throat. You know, and in the same way in our world, we're, we're content. You know, we're rich. We got everything going, but we're not thinking about where we're going and our lives are cut short. What meaning does our life have? And, and the scripture, the scriptures help us to find that meaning. The scriptures become light for our lives. So the scriptures enlighten. And third is that the scripture, the word of God is a word that encourages it's a word that encourages. It lifts our spirit. It gives us strength. It gives us hope. I, I think that's one of the greatest gifts of Scripture for us, is that it is for us a source of hope. 
it, it allows us to keep on going when the going gets tough. You know, you know the, the old saying, huh? When the when the going gets tough, the tough get going. No, when the going gets tough, the believer gets going, because to believe means to say that life is more than this difficult moment that I'm going through right now. Scripture then becomes a source of consolation. There's a wonderful word once that said, uh, you know, Christ came to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Right? Uh, that's a great line, huh? Christ came to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Well, afflicting the comfortable, that's the word of God that challenges. But comforting the afflicted, that's the word of God that consoles. So God's word is a word that challenges, that enlightens, and that consoles. That's the gift that is given to us. But we need to do something with that gift. It's not enough to have the gift. We have to do something. So then the first three weeks, we're looking at what a gift it is and why it is a gift. It is a gift because it challenges us. It is a gift because it enlightens us. It is a gift because it consoles us. But what should we do with this gift? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to seek to understand it. So God's word is a word to be understood. And this requires work, friends. This requires work. This requires study. It really does. We have to start studying Scripture. I mean, most people are satisfied with, you know, the, the, the homily they get on Sundays. And, and, I mean, that's a good starting point. But at least for me, it isn't enough. I, you know, in, in my journey towards priesthood and since then, I've spent the equivalent of six years university courses studying Scripture. And I, I still feel that I'm only scratching the surface. I still feel there's so much more to learn. I just bought a big book the other day, this thick, called The Theology of the Old Testament. I started reading it. You know, and I'm reading this. Oh, wow, look at this. I never realized. Oh, look at this. I didn't know that. You know, there's, there's just so much to learn. My little article, some people tell me that they read my article in the newspaper. Thanks for letting me know once in a while. You know, But, but yeah, every time I write that, I spend about an hour studying the text. I, I have an excellent technical Bible that gives me the meaning of passages so that I can study those, those meanings. I go to a, a Greek New Testament so I can read it in the original language, at least the main words, so I can use, so I know which words are being used because sometimes the specific word is, is, is a key to understanding the passage. I have to work at it. Now, we can't all spend years and hours and hours and hours. But we should all, I think, as Christians, as Catholics, be doing something to try to get a better sense of what Scripture is. So it's a word to be understood. Secondly, and this will be the theme of the fifth week, it's a word to be prayed. We need to learn to pray with Scripture. And that is something that very few people do, unfortunately. We, lead, we need to learn how to pray with Scripture. St. Ignatius had a beautiful method to pray with Scripture. It was a method with imagination. It works for the Gospels. It doesn't work for all the stories, but a lot of the Gospels. He said, when you read a text, read it, read it, read, read a story. Let's, let's say it's, I don't know, uh, uh, Jesus calling, Jesus calling the, uh, Peter, James, and John there, you know, to, to follow him. So you read the text. And then Ignatius says, now close your eyes and make a film. He didn't say make a film because he lived 400 years ago. They didn't have films. But that's what it means. Imagine in your mind the scene. Imagine. And, and don't just imagine, like, like, imagine what Peter and James and John must have looked like. Imagine what Jesus must have looked like, how they were dressed, you know. And, and, then, and then feel, feel the heat of the Mediterranean sun on your skin. Imagine you're in the crowd there on the side. Imagine you're on the crowd. And feel the heat of the sun. And smell, smell the sea. Smell, smell the sand. You know, and, and listen hear Jesus saying this. So what he basically is saying is that use your imagination and make a film of this. And as you do that, he's saying, how do you feel inside? What emotions are rising in your heart as you're doing this? And he says, those emotions are God's spirit kind of waking up in you a response to God's word. That's one way to pray with scripture. Here's an easier way to pray with scripture. It's, it comes from St. Benedict. Now, St. Benedict lived in the year 600. So St. Benedict said we should ruminate on Scripture. Do you know that verb, to ruminate? Cows ruminate, you know. Now, I don't know much about cows. I didn't grow up around them. But I'm told that cows have four stomachs. 
And, and when, when, they, when they pick up the grass there and they swallow it, it goes into a first stomach and kind of stews in the acids and the juice of the stomach. And then they bring it back up into their mouth. And they have to chew it again. They chew the cud. And then they swallow it again. It goes into the second stomach. And then it comes back up and they do it again. They send it back down. And, then, you know, and they have to do this four times to the same piece of food until it can finally go down the digestive tract. We have to do the same thing with Scripture. So says Benedict, St. Benedict. He says we need to ruminate on Scripture. What we need to do is we need to take a little bit of Scripture and come back to it over and over and over again and let it stew in our unconscious and then bring it back up and think about it. Then let it stew in our unconscious and bring it back up. So here's a way. I'm going to suggest a very easy way for you to pray with Scripture. Choose a verse, any verse, any verse that has a bit of meaning for you. I, I'm, do, I'm doing this with the Psalms. This week, uh, I, I'm, I'm doing it with the Psalm 2. There's a verse that says, Le Seigneur m'a dit, Tu es mon fils, moi aujourd'hui je t'ai engendré. The Lord said, You are my son, today I engendered you. I gave you life. So what do you do with it? Well, first of all, you memorize it. Because you're going, I'm going to spend a week with it. I'm going to spend a week with it. And the first thing I do when I get up in the morning is I say it to myself. And the last thing I do before going to bed at night is I say it again. And, and when I have time to pray, I, I repeat it over and over again. And, and I just think about it. And I wonder what it means. God said, you are my son. Today I have given you life. Now, I know because of my scripture study that this was a psalm that was said about David, King David. King David is being said, you are my son, I give you life. But I also know that the first Christians applied it to Jesus. You are my son, today I have given you life. But as Christians, we not only say it with King David and with Jesus, but we, know, we say it about ourselves. I am God's son, God's daughter. And today God gives me life. How does God give me life today? And so I stay with that sentence for the whole week. It nourishes my prayer. I keep on bringing it back to prayer. I think about its meaning. At the end of a week, that sentence is becoming alive to me. Can you see how that becomes alive? I'll drop it at the end of the week. I'll take another one. Just a line. And I'll ruminate on the line for a week. You know, just ruminate on one verse of Scripture. It's an easy way to pray with Scripture. But we need to be learning how to do this in our churches and in our lives. And finally, the last sub-theme is going to be God's Word is a Word to be Shared. Okay, so it's a word to be understood, and it's a word to be prayed, but it's also a word to be shared. And that's the whole question of evangelization. If it is good news, we don't want to keep this good news for ourselves. We want to share it with others. Why do we want to share it? Because it's good news. Because it's giving meaning to my life. I want you to have meaning in your life. It's giving me joy. I want you to have joy. One of our great problems when we speak about evangelization is we don't know why we want to evangelize. We don't know why we want others to believe. We don't know why we want others to come to church with us. We're not sure. We'd like our kids to do this and our grandchildren, but why? Why is it important for them to do it? You know, let's, it's not because God's going to send them to hell if they don't. You know, I, I think that might have been some of our mindset in the past, but I think we can drop that. You know, it's not that God's going to send them to hell. God still loves them. But it's still important for us to evangelize. Why? Yeah, you know, I remember I told a man once, you know, he was, he was telling me, it was my dad's friend. I had just been ordained as a young priest. And he said to me, he says, oh, he says, my 16-year-old son doesn't want to come to church anymore. I said, oh. He says, yeah. I said, so what did you do? Well, I told him, as long as he lives under my roof, he's going to live by the rules of my house and he's going to come to church on Sundays. I said, okay. And he says, what, that's not a good answer? I said, well, I, I'm not saying it's not a good answer, but uh, maybe you could have told him why you go to church. And then there was a moment of silence on his part. <laughs> I said, why do you go to church? And he looked at me and he says, um, to give my son a good example. <laughs> this is true. I'm not making this up. To give my son a good example. So I said, oh. I said, well, then... Uh, does that mean if you didn't have a son, you wouldn't be going to church? And he says, geez, I think you're right. 
I said, so you want to force your son to do something you wouldn't be doing if you didn't have a son? He said, boy, I'm going to have to think this through, huh? I said, yes, you have to start thinking this through. Why? Why is it that you want to share God's word with somebody? You have to start asking yourself. And, and the answers are here. Because it's a word that challenges and it's a word that enlightens and it's a word that comforts. Because of that, that's why it's a gift for us. It challenges us to be the best we can be. It enlightens us to give meaning to our lives and it comforts us and gives us strength when it's going on. This is why I want to share this with you. It can be a gift for you too. All right? So those are the six themes that we're going to be exploring during the six weeks of Parish Alive. Somebody was asking what, what, what this is and um, we, we thought in, in order to kind of um, create an awareness in the greater community of Parish Alive that we'd have a little symbol for it and we, we decided to take a, a, a green and yellow ribbons and so um, green obviously is the color of hope and, and this yellow which is kind of supposed to be gold Gold is the, the color of Christ the King. So it's our hope is in Christ. You know, that's what it means. Our hope is in Christ. And, and so um, a lot of the parishes, well, I mean, you don't have to take it from your parish. You can go and buy yourself a bit of green and yellow ribbon and, you know, either make yourself. What we were suggesting was that people tie it to their antennas so that when you go to the mall, you see people with the ribbons on, you know other people are doing parish life. And it's a little tool for evangelization because then people say, what are you wearing that for? Why do you have that on your cart? And you say, oh, we're doing parish life. Oh, what's parish life? You know, and then you get a chance to tell them, go, oh, you know. So it's a way to start the conversation around parish life. So just a little thing. So they're handing them out in parishes. But like I say, you don't have to wait for your, your parish to do it. You can go buy yourself a bit of green and yellow ribbon. And Well, the, the funny thing, though, is that oh, I said, when I, when I got my first one, I said, okay, I'll go tie it on my antenna. And that's when I realized there's no antenna in my car. I I'd, I'd, I'd never realized that before. There's no antenna in my car, these new cars. So I tied it on my uh, rear view mirror inside, you know, so it's there. So you can see it through the window. Anyway, uh, somebody asked an interesting question. They said, uh, if the temple was destroyed in the year 600, how could there be a temple in the time of Jesus? Because there was a temple in the time of Jesus. The temple was re rebuilt. When they came back, they rebuilt... So we speak about, uh, scripture scholars speak about the second temple era. So the second temple era starts about 500 before Jesus to the time of Jesus. Now what happened to, what happened to that second temple? It was destroyed in the year 65. The Romans came in and decided to, to destroy the temple because there were just too many rebellions that were rising up around the temple, centered on the temple. So in 65 they came and destroyed it. And in the year approximately 110, they came in and they destroyed all of Jerusalem and they forced everybody to leave Jerusalem. And so no Jews lived in Jerusalem until 1948 when the country of Israel was established by UN decree, you know. So that's the story of the, the Jewish people. So they had that first exile in the year 600, but then it was an exile for 2,000 years until the state of Israel was, was recreated. So, uh, any any questions or comments on the content that, that we've looked at there or uh, any any anything that comes to mind as, as we're talking about the word of god yes when, when yes when the jews reestablished their country they started they reestablished hebrew modern hebrew as a modern language so hebrew is the language of communication in israel again yeah, there's a bit of difference between, from what I'm told, between ancient Hebrew, hip, biblical Hebrew, and contemporary Hebrew. Like the Greek of the New Testament isn't quite the Greek that's spoken in Greece. But obviously, if you speak Greek, contemporary Greek, you can learn ancient Greek easier. So it's the same thing with Hebrew. You're right. Yeah. Somebody else had their hand up here, and then they'll come here. Palestine, Jesus was a, was a Jew, but um, Palestine is a geographic area, Okay. Palestinian does not designate a, a nationality or anything. It, it doesn't, it's, basically it's, a, it's the area where Israel is. But before 1948, who was living there? It, it was, the Jews weren't there, huh? In the land which is called Israel today. The, the people who lived there, they didn't have a country, they were just called the people who lived in Palestine, Palestinians. What happened with the, with the establishment of Israel and, and this is the whole point, is that these people were, were forced to leave their homes. So some of them are still living in refugee camps 60 years later. They would like to go back into what they consider their land. This is the, the source of the conflict between 
the, Is the Israelis today, we don't say the Israelites, the Israelis and the Palestinians. The Palestinians are people who live there. Now the Palestinians, which religion are they? Some Palestinians are, uh, most of the Palestinians are Muslim, but there a number of them are Christians. Maronites, Melkites, and Roman Catholic Palestinians. You know, so uh, so that's the reality there. Okay. Well, bad guys, good guys. I mean, everybody's everybody's a bit the bad guy, and everybody's a bit the good guy. The problem here is that two different, two very very different people trying to live on the same land, and and everybody getting hurt, and how they're going to work it out, I, I don't know. You know, and we really have to pray for that. The bishop of Jerusalem is a Palestinian. When, when I was at the Synod, we sat next to each other for, for meals. He's the patriarch of Jerusalem. He's the, the attitude of Jerusalem. <laughs> yes. Oh, excuse me. But just to answer your question, Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. That's clear. Yes. Well, will there ever be a third testament? Just to clarify, when the Jews speak of the Torah, they're speaking of just the first five books of, of, uh, of Scripture. So it's not the whole Old Testament that they call Torah because then there are the prophets. So often they'll speak about, Jesus says, the law and the prophets, the Torah and the prophets. All right? So those are the two sections. Then there's a section called wisdom, which is the Psalms and, and uh, the book of Proverbs, and the, you know, the various books that we call wisdom. So there are kind of three sections of the Old Testament, Torah, prophets, wisdom. Now, the, the, the Jews have all of that, but you have to understand what happened was it was after, when, when the second temple was destroyed in the year 65, the Jews realized that they were becoming very, very fragile in front of the power of the Roman Emperor. And so they decided we have to kind of clarify things. And the other problem was that a lot of the Jews were becoming disciples of Jesus. And they had to decide, can you be Jewish? and believe in Jesus at the same time. They had to decide that. In the same way that the Christians had to believe, do you have to be Jewish to be Christian? St. Paul's big struggle was, do you have to be Jewish in order to be Christian? St. Paul said, no. You don't have to be Jewish in order to be Christian. And that was the beginning of bringing the gospel to all the non-Jewish people. But the Jews had the other story. Can you be Christian and still be a Jew? And, the, and, and they gathered, and they studied this question, the leaders of the Jewish people, and they said, no. You can't be Christian and be Jewish at the same time. If you're following Jesus, you've cut yourself off because Jesus was establishing himself as the Son of God and we can't believe that there's a Son of God that's idolatry for them. So they said, no, you can't be Christian and Jewish at the same time. So at that point, they were forced to say, okay, so which books are part of our holy books? And they decided this is our holy books. They decided this around the year 70 or 80 after Jesus. At the same time, the Christians were debating what are our holy books. And the final decision was taken about 300 years after the time of Christ that these are our holy books. Okay, these, this is scripture. Now, why do we believe that there's nothing to be added? Because we believe that Jesus is the word of God incarnate. And so that in Jesus, God said everything he had to say. The revelation is complete. So nothing, nothing is to be added to it because if something is added to it, it doesn't come from Jesus. It would imply that Jesus was not sufficient, that the revelation in Jesus wasn't all that we needed. So we say, no, in Jesus, God spoke his ultimate word. All we have to do now is we have to understand that word and apply it to new situations. We call that development of doctrine. As we, as we apply God's word to new situations, the church's teaching grows and grows and grows. That's what we call the living tradition of the church. So that the living tradition of the church over a period of 2,000 years has gone richer and richer and richer. Why? Because the new situations force us to confront them with God's word. That's why we're continually learning more, understanding more about God's word. So there's a growth in the tradition, but not in the revelation. Does that make sense? These are... I mean, these are really important questions you're asking tonight. I mean, we, we, spent, we spent courses and courses and courses on this, you know. And, and the, at the Second Vatican Council, the text on the Word of God, that was one of the big issues they had to deal with, explain the relationship between God's Word and tradition. And let me give you an example. I, I use this example too. You know, I was talking about when somebody dies and you pull out the picture book and you talk about it. So I think about when my grandmother died. 
my mom's, my, my, not my grandmother, my grandfather, my mom's dad. I was with my mother and a couple of my aunts and my grandmother at my grandmother's house the night after the funeral. And, uh, you know, we were telling the old stories. And my grandmother at one point spoke about this great aunt of mine who had lived in Timmins. Now, I was from Timmins. So I said, I had a great aunt who lived in Timmins. I didn't even know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And she married this guy. And, uh, you know, I have a picture of them. So she opens, you know, the closet door. She pulls out this big shoebox puts it down and lifts it up. And sure enough, hundreds of pictures, old pictures in there. No order at all to them. And of course, when she pulled it out, my aunts gathered around the table and everybody's going through the pictures. Oh, look at this one. Look at this. this is, and this is you and this is you. And who's this? And my aunt would turn to my grandma and say, Mama, c'est qui ça? Who's this? And my grandmother would look at her. Oh, that's so and so. He was related to her, you know, and they they dated for a while, but then it broke off, you know. He moved away, and they're, okay, and they're, they're, what's this? Oh, that's the first car your dad had. Don't you remember that car? Oh no, you weren't born. You can't remember. That was the first car we had, you know. And, and uh, you know, your father worked so hard to get that car, you know, and he paid this much for it, and but it was total this wreck. Oh, he hated his cousin after that for a long time, you know. It, you know, it's telling all the stories, right? Well, the Bible is like the, the box of pictures, right? The church's tradition is the teaching. It's my grandmother's teaching. As my grandmother explained this to my aunts, then, you know, when my grandmother died, each aunt got her share of the pictures, you know, and, and so my mother has these pictures, and I sit down with my mother. My mother can tell me the stories because she got, him, got them from her mother. And, you know, if I ever get the pictures, I'll be able to explain it to, well, not my children, but... <laughs> My nephews and nieces. It'd probably go to my sister anyway, so uh, let me get out of that one there. <laughs> well, what happens is the stories, the, 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 the pictures are kind of the Bible text, but just opening the Bible, just opening and starting to read, sometimes it's clear, but sometimes it's not. And how these passages relate to this passage, and which passages are really important anyway. You know, the list of the genealogy of the people who were, you know, went back to Jerusalem, it's, that's not important. The, the rules of purity for the priests at the temple are not important. The fact that uh, Tobit uh, in the story is he's going to meet his new wife and his dog is walking next to him and the dog's tail is wagging, that's not an important verse in Scripture, folks. <laughs> the wagging tail, that's not an important verse. So what are the important verses? See, and this is where tradition is so important because... The tradition of the church, as it's handed down from generation to generation, keeps us in touch with the original meaning of Scripture. And in the church, there's a special group of people who have that task to ensure that that meaning is not lost, and that is the bishops. That's what we call the magisterium. The magisterium is the teaching authority in the church, and the teaching authority belongs to the bishops because it's the bishops' task to make sure that that is held on and handed on from generation to generation. And we believe that God would not allow that to be done wrongly. He wouldn't allow for Scripture to be misunderstood. And so we believe that the, the, the bishop didn't really listen to him back then because it would have saved a lot of heartache. But the problem was when they said, uh, Luther, you can go to hell. Basically, that's what he was told. He left with a bunch of people. And then it wasn't just the original points that he was making. He started veering and shearing on a lot of other points. Well, when one starts that, then one of his friends, so I don't agree with you on that point of interpretation. So he started his own church, which became the Calvinist. And then, you know, some people said, well, we don't agree with Calvin on this point. And so they started their own church, which became the Arminian. And so what happens now is there are 2,000 Protestant churches in the world. Because every time somebody doesn't agree with somebody else, they start their own church. And that's the problem when there's no guiding authority within the church to ensure that the tradition is handed on. That's the richness of the church. We can chafe under it. We can be angry about it. We can not agree. But at least we can say, well, this is where we stand. And so let's move together on this. Right now, the Anglican church throughout the world is going through a huge crisis because they cannot come to an agreement on some very essential issues. And because of it, I wouldn't be surprised if in a few years from now we see the Anglican Church splitting into different groups, you know, because of that. Yes? Yeah.
Oh, God, no, the Quran is not straightforward. <laughs> the Quran is harder to understand than Scripture. For us, there's a basic narrative flow. There's a story being told. And you can follow the story. And even if there are points that you don't get, you, can't, you can follow the story. There is no story in the Quran. The Quran requires much deeper study to be able to pull the riches out. And, of course, they have a whole tradition of interpretation, too. So the point, just maybe to clarify, because we were talking about this, is because, you know, he had heard that in the Quran there's a line about killing the infidels. And he was asking, is that really in the Quran? But what's important, I think, you know, most of, most, the great majority of Muslims, what they do is they resituate that line in the context, the historical context in which Muhammad was, was living, where he was being threatened by the, uh, the idolaters. Because the problem is when, when Muhammad started teaching there's only one God, then the people in the village where he lived who had many gods, they were saying, you're crazy. And at one point, he started being persecuted. They started killing members of his family, and he was forced into exile. And so what was the correct response to that in one of his mystical experiences? You know, God tell him, well, make war, kill the infidels. So he made war, and, and, and he won. So for him, that was a sign that God was on his side. And that's why when then they went into the, 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 their temple and they, then they destroyed all the idols. And that's why the, the, the Muslims, for example, have no idols. They have no representation. If you go into a, a mosque, there's no pictures, there's no images because they're very much against idolatry. And that's why they have trouble with Christianity. The idea of three persons and one God for them sounds like idolatry. So the Muslims today, 90 nine percent of Muslims would not agree that that sentence means that today they should be killing people who don't believe. But there's a fringe group of people who are using that to justify the terrorism that they're doing. It is not representative of Islam. That's just like the IRA is not representative of Catholicism. If you judge Catholicism by looking at the IRA, anybody who would judge Catholicism by looking at the IRA, I'd say that's not fair. The IRA is a fringe group. They're actually against what the gospel is about. Most Muslims would say it's the same thing with these terrorists. They are not true Muslims and do not judge Islam by those terrorists. So I think, I think it's a fair comparison. But yes, at the back, and then we'll come to you. Would John the Baptist be the last prophet? Jesus said he's the last prophet because the prophets were all, in a sense, looking forward to the Messiah. And so once the Messiah is here, there's no need for prophets. But St. Paul talking about the early church, says that there's a gift of prophecy in the early church. Among the charisms of the Spirit, there's a gift of prophecy. And so he says, so among us there are prophets. But the difference here is that the gift of prophecy for Paul meant the gift of being able to, in a sense, judge the present situation with God's eyes. What would God say to this situation? And, and so to, to, to say that God, you know, in front of us, this is what he would say facing this situation. So that's the gift of prophecy. I think there are prophets among us. There are people who, who really look at the world today with God's eyes and say, look, we have to do this, we have to do that, we have to do that. In a sense, they're exercising the gift of prophecy, though we don't call them prophets, and, and their writings don't go into Scripture. But the Old Testament, there were a number of people who claimed to be prophets. The problem was to say, who are the real prophets, who are the false prophets? You know, of course, if you didn't agree in an interpretation... You know, there's one famous scene where, uh, who is it, Amos and uh, the prophet at Bethel, whose name I forget right now. You know, the prophet from Bethel says to Amos, leave here, go away, go prophesy elsewhere. Your prophecies aren't acceptable here. You're a false prophet. And Amos says, you're the false prophet. Well, of course, you know, it's easy to say to each other, you're the false prophet. You're... But it's Amos's book that was kept, so he must be the right prophet. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question here. Yeah. Before Vatican II, we weren't brought up to read the Bible. And the reason we weren't brought up to read the Bible was because there was a fear that of what happened with the Protestant movement, is that everybody starts reading the Bible. And if you read the Bible outside of the tradition, you can start m making it say all sorts of things. So it's important for us. As Catholics today, we still say, yes, read the Bible, but read the Bible within the tradition the Catholic tradition, to be able to make sure you understand right. So because there was a fear that it would be read outside of the tradition, a bit like the Jews would say, let's not use God's name in vain, so we won't say God at all. Let's not misinterpret the Bible, so don't read it at all. So that was the attitude. Now, at the Second Vatican Council, the bishops realized that this is 
this is not the right attitude to take. The right attitude is to, yes, study Scripture, but study it within the tradition of the church. So do both. Rather than do nothing, do both. One of the big changes in the liturgy, if you remember, you know, when I was a kid, the priest would read, you know, he'd be at the altar, and he'd read an epistle on one side, and then the gospel on the other side. I can never remember which side. But then he'd go preach, and it wouldn't be on the text that had been read. So one of the big things that happened was that it, it was decided the Second Vatican Council that the preaching would be on the text. And the other thing that decided was that the texts were always the same every year. Always the same every year. So they decided there would be three-year cycle instead, which would allow us to get to hear more texts, and we would add a third reading instead of just two readings, because there was never any readings from the Old Testament. So they added a reading from the Old Testament so we could learn. So by adding readings, putting on a three-year cycle, we get to hear all the texts. person who goes to Mass every Sunday at the end of the three years has heard nearly all the Gospels and nearly all the readings of Paul. Yeah. Oh, that's, well, yeah, most of them are stories and they're not true. They're the stories in the Bible. We recognize that the first 12 chapters of the Bible are, are myth in the Catholic Church. We recognize that they're, they're old stories. We don't take them as scientific fact. But we take them as stories that enlighten us on the meaning of life. But those are the first 12 chapters. After that, everything is pretty well historic. There was a question on this side and then we'll go to Inus. Well, the creationist leaves them, it leaves them outside of the Catholic Church. <laughs> you know, creationism is not part of the... You know, when we speak about the, what is the tradition of the church and the, the teaching of the, of the bishops, is that creationism is not part of a correct understanding of Scripture. Because I know Catholics who go to church every Sunday and they are... Creationists. Well, I'm not going to argue with them. Our salvation doesn't depend on whether the world was created in six days no, or not. Well, I would say that they're not aware of the church's teaching on this. Usually they're not aware. So, you know, like I remember teaching this to children, to, ch to children, to high school students. And, you know, kids would come back and say, well, my mother says that, my father says that. Well, don't, I said, don't argue with your parents over this. Don't, uh, it's not worth arguing with your parents over whether the world, world was created in six days or not. What's important is that scripture makes sense for you. And what I'm telling you is the teaching of the church. So, for example, John Paul II said it correctly, said it clearly a couple of years ago before he died. The first chapters of the Bible, they're not there to tell us how the world was made. They're there to tell us why the world was made. Science will answer the question of how. Scripture will answer the question of why. Scripture is at the level of the meaning, not about the rules. Yes, if, if you pick up the Catechism of the Catholic Church, you find the tradition pretty well summed up there. The Catechism is the summary of the tradition of the Church. That's right. So, so the question here is, what about these images of God, you know, being the God of war and the killing God and everything in the Old Testament? Obviously, there's a progression in the Old Testament in the understanding of God. The understanding of God at the beginning of the Old Testament is, is very partial it grows and is purified through the centuries. For example, the prophets who lived, the prophets, see David is here, but the great writing prophets were about the year 800 to 600. The great prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Hosea, those great prophets were in those 200 years. Those prophets really challenged the people in their traditional understanding of God because they brought out the fact that God is a God of mercy, a God of, of forgiveness, a God of love, and a God who is more concerned with justice than with rules of purity. There, there was a great time during those two years of, how could you say, of a purification. At the time of the founding of Judaism, there was a great time of purification of old understandings of God. So yes, there, the, the understandings of God in the Old Testament are partial and, and incomplete and wrong at times. And so they need to be purified as well. And ultimately in Jesus, then we get God's ultimate word. And that's, so that's why we have to interpret the Old Testament through Jesus. Because it is through him that we can see what is right, what is wrong, what is to be kept. And, and so in church, usually the, the texts of the Old Testament that we read are those that correspond to the way Jesus understood it. You know, and the other texts are, are left aside. All right? So I think we're going to have to Call it an evening. It's a quarter to or 15 minutes over time. 
Thank you. So at least I said, I said that God's Word is a word to be studied. Well, we've just spent an hour and a half studying it. And so that's very good. One of my great hopes after we've done Parish Alive is that we see more Bible scripture study groups and faith sharing groups starting up in our parishes. So Parish Alive is kind of to kickstart the whole process so that in our parishes people will start saying, hey, I have to learn more about this. I have to get more into my faith. So hopefully through these four seasons, this hunger for God's word is going to grow among us. And that is my hope and my prayer.